Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I welcome Marcelino Alvarez, founder of Photon Marine, which is developing high-powered electric outboard motors for commercial boats. Photon Marine was also a recent participant of Pitch Latin X, an accelerator aimed at Latinx founders. What is Latinx founders? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Latinx Founders was co-founded by Portland entrepreneurs Juan Barraza, Edgar Navas, and myself, and we held our first event since the pandemic on October 5th, 2022 at Reed on Salmon in Southeast Portland, showcasing Latinx entrepreneurs from all different industries, including tech, food, consumer goods, footwear, as well as the marine industry and photon marine. The Latinx Accelerator Program will begin accepting applications for our first cohort at the start of 2023, and our goal is to help over 100 founders get to the $1 million in recurring revenue in five years. It is a lofty goal, and that is why this is important. I am proud to say we are on our way with the filing of our formal nonprofit Latinx founders with the entrepreneurial organization Built Oregon as our fiscal sponsor. Our aim is to support Latinx entrepreneurs and in innovators and help them achieve their respective missions as it will help propel Oregon's economy and that is why an entrepreneur should care. Just as Photon Marine propels the boat industry into uncharted territories, becoming a pioneer without a frontier, Latinx Founders hopes to support the discovery of the uncharted because after all, Latinx Founders is here to help the Oregon entrepreneur and a globe of entrepreneurs. Thank you and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Marcelino Alvarez. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Marcelino, welcome to the show. I'm very excited. This is very unique. In fact, we got connected um, online uh, through a, a, a uh, mutual contact. But really today what we're going to be talking about is your company that you've been kind of scaling. Photon. Photon Marine. Photon yeah. Marine. Photon Marine. So I'm pretty excited about this because it's very new. I got a I got an opportunity to kind of hear about it briefly at the Latin X uh, Pitch Latino. But unfortunately you were you weren't able to make it. So I'm really excited to be able to have this opportunity. So please first um, who are you? Uh, give the world a little family education and career path. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first off, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here and, and, and share, share my story and, and my background and, uh, and, and how I got here. Uh, I, I don't think it was a direct path. And so I think that's maybe an, an important thing to kind of impart uh, with, with folks is that uh, the path to where we get to is not always a direct line. And, and those little kind of terms and, and, and crooks along the way are just as important as, as the destination. So uh, Marcelino Alvarez, uh, I, uh, Grew up in South Florida, uh, son of a Cuban father and a Puerto Rican mother. I was born in Dominican Republic. Uh, I like to joke that my childhood uh, was straight out of a Jimmy Buffett song. Uh, I, I spent my summers in the uh, the Florida Keys above and below the water uh, and really just kind of grew up with a, with a, a fond appreciation of the ocean uh, and and really just, you know, uh, an appreciation for the respect and, and treatment of the ocean. I think, I think back then, conservation was a really simple principle. It was sort of this idea of you know throw back the small fish today so they can become bigger fish tomorrow uh, you know treat the coral reefs with respect today so that they can you know provide for those fish tomorrow and, and respect the ocean today so that it might pass you know for for 
Um, I might be around for, for future generations tomorrow. And as I think about what we're building at Photon Marine, like I, I'd love to believe that it's just as much about scaling up those principles that is, is, as it is, you know, decarbonizing marine propulsion, which we'll get to. Uh, uh, academically, I thought I was going to be an ophthalmologist. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I came home uh, when I was eight years old uh, from the eye doctor because I need my first pair of glasses and told my dad, I'm going to be a doctor. And he's like, great, I don't have to worry about you. Uh, and so, and so uh, just kind of, you know, basically like avoided the eye of Sauron for like the next, you know, uh, 14 or so years uh, and went to school thinking I was going to be, you know, an ophthalmologist. I thought I'd study engineering, biomedical engineering specifically to kind of get there and uh, found myself hitting a wall my freshman year of college at Duke University as I was taking some math classes I probably shouldn't have been as a freshman and, and just kind of got my butt kicked. Uh, left the engineering program and just kind of said, you know what, engineering is a really kind of strange path to get to, to becoming a night doctor. I'll just, just stick to the, the pre-med track and, uh, and did that and, and it wound up majoring in, in political science and was pretty much done with all my pre-med requirements uh, when a startup uh, out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, called Zoom Culture, uh, kind of said, hey, uh, we're, we're doing video, you know, uh, on the internet, uh, would you like to shoot video? And I'd always enjoyed kind of shooting and, and editing video. So I was like, yeah, it sounds fun. And it blew us out to the Sundance Film Festival in, you know, in 2001. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to be a filmmaker. Forget pre-med. So, so I dropped my last, <laughs> second, maybe second to last pre-med class from Park City, Utah. Uh, and that was the first time that my dad was like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah, um, let's see, long story short, uh, I graduated in 2002 and kept working for that company, obviously dot com bubble hit, uh, startup ran out of money. Uh, and I found myself, uh, actually stumbled into advertising. I had a, a resume on monster.com, some ad agency that was like a regional office of a regional office of a big ad agency, found my resume online and said, Hey, uh, looks like you can manage, you know, video production and, and maybe some radio production. Would you like to, to do this? And so I got. I cut my teeth at, a, at an ad agency called J. Walter Thompson uh, in Miami doing really bad, <laughs> really bad TV commercials uh, for Ford Motor Company, the ones that you would see in between, you know, innings of a baseball game or, you know, commercials and a ones. basketball game. <laughs> no, 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 not the ones with a lot of budget. These are the ones that are like, hurry up now to tenth deal 2000. <laughs> Get a Ford Focus. Uh, European tune suspension. Yeah, they it were worked. awful. I got and, one uh, front. I, it worked. It, I now have a there you go. Focus. There you go. There you go. You know, so I did radio. That was a thing back then. <laughs> uh, you know, precursor to podcasts. And, uh, you know, learned a little bit about advertising and found that there was a really cool ad agency down the street that had a bunch of young people working at. And they were doing really cool things on the internet called Chris and Porter Vygotsky. And so uh, had some friends that, you know, mutual friends of friends that kind of worked there. And I spent, you know, better half of a year trying to figure out how to get in. And they finally hired me as a, uh, integrated producer, so kind of sat between you know TV production and web production, which is sort of a, a blossoming discipline, and uh, did some really cool things there. Uh, worked on some campaigns for VW, worked on some campaigns for ConAgra, Coke, uh, you name it. And honestly, could have probably stayed in South Florida uh, for quite a bit uh, longer, uh, if not for some hurricanes that hit in 2006. Uh, and the guy whose name on the, was on the door said, you know what, we're moving to Boulder, Colorado. And uh, for me, as a lifelong, you know, Floridian, uh, the idea of moving to a landlocked state uh, stressed me out. And so I reached out to some friends who uh, had previously uh, worked with me and had moved out to Portland, Oregon. And I said, hey, you all know, joined this agency called Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, what are you all doing on the digital side of things? What are you doing on the website? And, and they were admittedly at the very early stages of figuring out like where, where the web would go for, for their brands. And, uh, a friend of mine and I kind of submitted a, a, a cover letter and a resume and said, hey, we'll, we'll help you build out that, that interactive production department. We've done a lot of work here in Miami over the last couple of years, and we think we can help you, you know, build upon that and, and, and kind of catch up to, to where, where the industry was going. And I think we got lucky that a couple of the folks that we interviewed with, uh, you know, <laughs> thought our, our approach to building an interactive department uh, was, was endearing. We, we based it on the book Moneyball, which, which was still a book, not a movie. And they're like, sure, let's give these kids a shot. Um, came out to Portland in 2006, uh, you know, really, really quickly learned that this was a, you know, an organizational design project in addition to, to building out capacity. And, uh, you know, goal was to put Widen on the map digitally and, and uh, spent, you know, a difficult three and a half years trying to figure out what that meant. And as a, you know, general principle, I'm a general principle, I'm a sort of, you know, prove it by doing it kind of person and, and, 
we we had some wins. Uh, we worked on some cool projects, got some you know uh, opportunities with some trusted clients, and I would say that my my claim to fame over that period of time was uh, building a, a graffiti writing robot that we took to the Tour de France in 2009 <laughs> called the Nike Chatbot, and it was you know both the coolest thing I ever worked on and, and also the most difficult thing I ever worked on, and uh, we had a blast. Uh, I realized you know uh, that. I could spend the rest of my career in advertising and I would never recreate that moment. And so I uh, got back from that production and said, you know what, I think I'm ready for something else. Uh, kind of kind of quit quit on a high note. And around that time, uh, you know, we had just started to, uh, you know, see mobile applications, uh, you know, kind of come come into, for, into, the, into existence. The App Store had just come out. And I was like, you know, I, I think there's something here. And so uh, really started thinking through what that might look like to build apps uh, and decided, you know what, I bet you that we could build a company around this. So quit my day job uh, and uh, I joined what was uh, what was called the Portland Incubator Experiment. Hi, still still around. Uh, and, and Rick Therese is basically downstairs in, in the basement of, of Wyden Kennedy, first floor of Wyden Kennedy, and said, hey, I'm going to build apps. So uh, that's that's where Uncork Studios uh, launched. That was my, my product design company and uh, did that for about 10 years. Uh, started out as mobile app design and development. Apps got commoditized as we moved to, to, you know, designing interfaces for anything with the screen. We started doing hardware projects uh, and uh, yeah, went through some ups, went through some downs and, and ultimately sold that to a bigger consultancy uh, called Fresh Consulting uh, back in 2019. And then, you know, found myself on the other side of the acquisition about three months later, staring at a pandemic and the, the world truthfully just sort of, you know, flips upside down. And, and I think, I think like many of us, you know, just kind of struggle a little bit to kind of find purpose and meaning in sort of this new reality of, of, of uh, you know, mid, mid pandemic sort of life, like, you know, spent most of my time on a zoom, uh, my, my, my little children, you know, who going into the pandemic were, you know, three and two respectively would see me with AirPods in my ears and be like, Oh, dad's working, you know, uh, or if I didn't have AirPods in my ear, dad's not working. And, you know, I would stare at this ring light all day long and, and, and kind of just, you know, talk to myself and just realize like, you know what, I don't, I don't know what's next yet, but whatever it is, like needs to have, you know, more, more presence in, 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 in a physical form and be more than just, you know, digital. It, need, it needs to be physical. And so uh, reached out to a, a buddy of mine, uh, Charles Seinbeck, who'd been an entrepreneur in residence at our space and his background fisheries nonprofits. And was like, Hey, Charles, what, what, what are you doing that, uh, you know, might, might benefit from some technology and, you know, talk about a bunch of things. And he kind of mentioned, he's like, you know, we don't build electric boats like there's just no amount of conservation that can keep up i was like oh that's an interesting problem i'm a lifelong boater i grew up in south florida i've been boating here in portland since you know 2012 like why don't we why don't we just go buy some torpedo motors as a you know competitor of ours and, and and we'll just put in the back of a jamaican fishing boat and very quickly realized that the uh the motors that were out there weren't powerful enough to, to move those boats and, and certainly needed some charging infrastructure just kind of went down this rabbit hole and so one thing led to another, and before you knew it, we uh, we started Photon Marine, uh, a company that's building electric outboard motors for, for commercial boat fleets. Man, you know, it's kind of crazy because you started out wanting to be an eye doctor, and now you're completely, you've done everything in between. <laughs> yeah, you completely <laughs> went the different direction. But you know what's interesting is at the end of the day, you kind of found, you know, something you're passionate about as well that you're working on. Why, how, how has had that passion for boating? You kind of mentioned that you've been boating for some time. How has that helped create the Photon Marine brand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a great insight. I, it, it is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And, and I think generally, you know, kind of conveying something that as a very little, you know, kid was, was sort of imparted upon me and now translating that into a, a career or the next chapter of my career. Uh, it just, it, it removes so many of the unknowns of stepping into a new thing because it seems so familiar. Uh, you know, I, I, I spend part of my week, you know, working on, on, on the boat or in the shop around the boat. And these are, these are things that, you know, for me were part of my childhood. I would, you know, on weekends, we'd go down, you know, to, to our, you know, to our boat and do work on the boat or, you know, the winter in between, you know, sort of the, the, the summer and, and, and the, the spring and, and, and in Florida, you know, we, we would work on, on, on the boat and that is now a part of my job and it doesn't seem like a job, which doesn't seem like, doesn't seem fair to be perfectly honest with you. And so I think parlaying something that, uh, yeah, that, that, that one is passionate about in, into a career is, is 
uh, it, I feel like it gives me an unfair advantage, if I can be perfectly honest with you, because this doesn't feel like work. Um, and that's not to say there aren't hard aspects to it, but it just doesn't feel like work. Uh, yeah. you know, the, the hard challenges are, are worth solving and the effort to, to complete them are worth solving. Um, and I would also say that, like, for me, part of that reset in the pandemic was about understanding purpose and legacy and impact. I mean, I think there was a very, you know, sort of visceral and, and tangible fragility that, that we all went through in the pandemic where we realized like, wait, is this thing going to like wipe us out? Like, like, you know, it, it, yeah. like, like mortality, I think sort of was you know, put to the forefront in ways that I don't think as a, as a society, you know, we've had sort of this level of collective reckoning. And to be fair, I would argue that the, you know, a vast majority, maybe a third of our society still hasn't had the reckoning of, of what the last year. So I don't think it's, it's necessarily pervasive, but I think for me, it's just understanding that if I'm going to spend, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing a thing, that that thing better leave the world in a much better place than what I found it. And and again, through that lens, this doesn't seem like work either. It feels like I'm fulfilling a life's mission. And, and I've, you know, I've, I've talked to people who have, you know, had sort of this like eureka moment, aha, like a, a calling for like a, a, like a, a purpose bigger than oneself. I've never been that person. Like I've never, you know, <laughs> if someone has come with a calling, like I, I haven't been there. I haven't heard the doorbell ring. I haven't answered it. And I would say that. This is perhaps the first time that I have felt this is this is why I'm here, and this is the thing that I need to solve. Because if I don't do it, I don't think anybody else can. And that might be a combination of like entrepreneurship, naivete, complete ignorance, uh, you know, stupidity. <laughs> you, you label it right, but that that is generally how I feel. In regards, to, let's talk about how the how the process actually gets going. How did you? You know, you mentioned you're trying to solve the problem uh, for future generations. How are you solving the problem? How did you find out to use this battery that can go in the water? In particular, how did you find one that's strong enough to push a boat? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we started looking at when we were looking at uh, electrification of boats is sort of the, the limits of the physics, right? Uh, you, can only, you can only push uh, so much juice into a motor from a battery and it is five times as difficult to push a boat through the water as it is a car through the air. And so we recognized quickly that there were some limitations to what you could do in an electric uh, outboard motor propelled boat. And I would say that for a lot of other people, they probably got there and said that this is too hard or this is too difficult or there's not a big enough, you know, audience, you know, we're out. I think for me, that became a bit of more of a, of a focusing point. Like what, all right, these are the limitations, right? Like you can't, you might not be able to go 40 miles off the coast of Oregon or off the coast of Florida at full throttle uh, and get back, you know, with, with the battery uh, of, of reasonable size. You know, you can only throw so many batteries into a boat for 40 seconds. But, uh, you know, there are applications that are much shorter distance than that. So we kind of started focusing in and, and I would say that one of the things that we started researching around, around that time as we were qualifying opportunities for electrification was what was just working in electrification broadly. Like what were some of the case studies that, that, um, that had demonstrated uh, success? And, you know, I think everyone talks about Tesla, sort of that automotive success, but, but we uh, actually honed in on electric buses and the electrification of school buses and electrification of municipal buses and said, you know, this is an interesting reference point for us. Uh, a bus leaves, you know, the the, the depot. It, it goes on an established route. It has repeated stops along the way, and it comes back to that depot at the end of the day. The way that those buses are financed, the way that they, you know, have, you know, sort of their 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 uh, their, their capex, like the way that you know their cost structure, like it, it all looks really, you know, uh, pretty optimal for electrification. They use their buses a lot. They've got opportunity to kind of recharge overnight. And so we kind of asked ourselves, what looks like an electric bus on the water? And I'll say that that's different from some of our competitors who, who, who may have started with the question, how do we build an electric Yamaha or an electric Mercury? And I think those two questions lead to two very different places. And so we said, okay, here are applications in marine uh, that, that look like an electric bus. Obviously, water taxis look like an electric bus because it's literally uh, a bus in the water. But there are also, you know, shore excursions that you might do if you take a, you know, cruise vacation somewhere in the Caribbean and you get off the big cruise ship, 
uh, you get kind of, you move, you know, from the cruise ship to the port on a tender boat, which is you know, maybe like a, a boat that moves 150 or 200 people. And then once you're there, you know, you're, you're signing up for, for the, the scuba, uh, uh, you know, scuba class or the, the snorkel trip or the, the fishing trip. Those are, you know, trips where the, the operator leaves that same spot, goes to that reef and then kind of comes back. And that trip takes about two and a half hours because the cruise company wants to move as many people through a trip throughout the day. Uh, so that became sort of our reference point. And, and we said, well, what else looks like this? And we're like, oh, a lot of seaweed uh, farming, aquaculture, mariculture operations. Operator leaves the dock, goes to the same spot, does an activity there, comes back. And so we just honed in on those and said, is this big enough uh, to, to electrify? Can we get around some of the constraints of, of you know, distance if we pair it with shoreside infrastructure, shore, shoreside charging. The good news is, is that a lot of marinas already have access to electricity at the dock because you have to charge the batteries that are already on a boat that are used to turn on the motor or run your you know, equipment when you're anchored on a reef you know, doing, doing the fishing. Uh, and in some cases, we might need something closer to like a Tesla supercharger, like a level three charger. And we've got a partner that, that does that, builds out those, those charging stations. So that's kind of what we honed in on. And, and Admittedly, I think we, we've established enough customer interest from prospective customers who are like, okay, there, there's a there there. Uh, let's get after some pilots. And that's, that's where sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're at. So we, we finished our, our first prototype earlier this spring. That was for a 100 horsepower prototype motor. Now we're working on a 300 horsepower prototype motor. Goal is to debut that at the Miami International Boat Show uh, in February of next year. That's, that's the world's biggest boat show. But uh, I think a personal point of point of pride is that that's also my hometown uh, boat show that that I you know, uh, went to growing up as a kid, and uh, and yeah, from there uh, start delivering on some pilots and really understand sort of the opportunity, capability, uh, potential for electrification for these industries that, that we're looking at. You know, so you've you've kind of worked in various industries and you've kind of done different entrepreneurial endeavors. Some from you know from White and Kennedy, kind of working more uh, with an organization, kind of a, a corporate entrepreneur. Then others as an individual. What are what are like creating Photon Marine currently and scaling it? What are some of the skills and traits that you're so glad you learned back in the past? That are like, man, I'm so glad I actually, even though that was very difficult. I'm glad I went through it because now it's helping me out with this. Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the, the, the key things that each chapter of my career has exposed me to different types of, of creativity. I think when I was in advertising, that creativity typically meant off the wall ideas for you know, an ad campaign or you know, something to support a product. Uh, which fundamentally, you know, regardless of, of how off the wall that idea was, came down to storytelling. How do we tell a compelling sto uh, story in, in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or, or on a website where you might even have less time to, to convey that intent? Uh, I also had an opportunity to work alongside, alongside some really incredible uh, designers, some really incredible thinkers, and I just, you know, be part of a creative culture that that was sticky, you know, both Christian Porter Brugowski and, and certainly Wyden and Kennedy had cultures that, you know, the founders established that really took a life of their own. And so I would say that working in a hyper creative uh, culture that was just fun, they're just, they're both really fun places to work. Um, that, that and, and intense, right? There was certainly an intensity to that really just helped me understand the potential for what creativity uh, could mean. You know, starting my own company, you know, uh, uncorked, I, I think what I learned was that creativity wasn't just limited to those who had the word creative in their title, mm -hmm. art director, copywriter, that, that inherently there was a level of creativity to the technical implementation of a thing, uh, that there was creativity to uh, the methodology by which you bring something to life and, and how you understand uh, potential customers' needs, and and that the product development process is incredibly iterative. You don't have, you know, <laughs> perfect is the enemy of good. It, it is true, but that there's also a limit to that. That you know, if you ship something that's completely flawed or doesn't look good enough, you're never going to get you know uh, enough traction. You you know, you still only have one one chance for that that first impression. And so, balancing out the storytelling aspects with the iterative product development cycle, I think came you know became part of that. And, and I think, you know, hardware, software uh, developments are, you know, processes are, are, are different, but, but fundamentally, 
there is quite a bit of overlap in that process and, and understanding again, what's the problem that you're solving? Uh, how do you make sure that you are testing throughout the, the product design process to ensure that you're meeting your customers' needs? And then as you, as you do get things in front of your customers, how are you, you know, separating your own bias for what you think that thing should do from what it needs to do? And, and I would say that as I, as I look about, you know, how we're going to build hardware motors, uh, you know, the, the hardware, the motors and, and, and the software platform to support our efforts. Uh, and how do we tell that story in a way that, that differentiates us from others who might be building an electric boat or an electric motor at a different horsepower profile. All those things uh, are, are, you know, part of what I do every single day from the investor pitches to the recruitment of talent, to the, explaining you know the value proposition to a prospective customer uh to even this conversation that we're having here and so i you know honestly believe it we kind of talked about this at the, at the front that if i hadn't taken those turns into advertising then product design i couldn't have landed here i certainly couldn't have started here uh this is a culmination of everything else that i have done and so i am stronger at what i'm doing today because of the diversity of what i did before Nice. And, you know, one, one of the things, too, you mentioned uh, previously is you're, you're kind of going through the prototypes, creating various prototypes. So you're still scaling this business. So it's still relatively new. Now, you're, you're kind of going, what, what is the financing? Are you kind of going through like venture capital? Are you going through that piece right now? And how is that process? Yes, uh, the process answer is yes. Uh, we are uh, we're a venture-backed uh, company. Uh, obviously building hardware is very capital intensive. And, and while I wish I could self-finance that, I, I, I certainly don't have those resources to do so. So we were fortunate to have received the backing of a, of a number of local investors in, in Portland to kind of get on the way, uh, get underway, and as well as uh, some institutional VCs that came on early and saw the potential of our founding team. You know, I talked a little bit about uh, Charles, who, you know, came from a fisheries background, uh, has, has spent his whole lifetime in, 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 in that world and has deep connections. But my other two co-founders are uh, equally as knowledgeable about you know, each of their domain ex expertise. And so uh, my chief strategy officer, Tara Russell, comes from a career in cruise, uh, built a cruise line for Carnival Corp has, and, and was also chief impact officer. And uh, our chief technical officer, Nick Sheps, comes from electric motorcycles and built three Isle of Man winning motorcycles for Team Motuses. And so I think the... The pitch to investors was, early on was, here's a, an incredibly experienced founding team for whom this was not, you know, the, the first rodeo, and let's let's give them enough money to to build that first prototype, and and you know, and then ask for more money. And so we we did that and and achieved that first prototype in the spring, and then we said, great, now we need more money, uh, and now we're raising our you know our, our seed round right now, and have you know some some notable commitments uh, for that. I would say that the process for that, you know, it is both inspiring, frustrating, and, you know, something to learn from at the same time, right? Because, you know, I had been on the other side as like a, you know, startup judge for a number of things over the years. I've mentored startups that were venture backed. And, and truthfully, it's something you have to go through to really understand, you know, sort of the, the challenges. I mean, it's, it's storytelling, right? You have to nail a pitch within a certain amount of time and you have to be able to anticipate the questions that you're going to get from investors. You have to create a, a compelling vision for where it can go that is not too detached from reality, right? Because you need to certainly follow through with that, but that also isn't anchored, you know, by reality or, or perhaps, you know, overly anchored by reality, right? It needs to kind of float between where you are today and where you want to go tomorrow and, and be equal parts between the reality of where you're at today and where you want to be tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's what I spend probably the bulk of my time doing is, is reaching out to investors, going to conferences and summits and, and pitching things, you know, like the, the Pitch Latino event, uh, as, as well as other regional conferences. And then, you know, getting connected to a network of uh, institutional VCs. And, you know, I like people, I like networking, and I like meeting, you know, new folks. And I've, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed aspects of it, right, of kind of creating a new network that I didn't have before because I had, you know, some regional networks and that helped, but I certainly didn't have the deep connections into, uh, into a number of, you know, these other areas. And so, you know, working with uh, allies or others that are adjacent to you or in this space that could make a warm intro uh, has been really beneficial. You know, we've got a, a buddy of ours, uh, Dimitri Gershenson, who's got a uh, a revenue-based financing platform called Enduring Planet. And 
but we're not a good candidate for for his platform. He's just plugged into the same people we're going after. And then, so, you know, he made a lot of intros that that led to investors and a warm intro uh, is is infinitely better than a cold intro. And, and, you know, there's all sorts of complexities and biases associated with the fact that you need to have a network to kind of do that. And, and, and I both acknowledge that and recognize that I didn't have that network. And so, you know, my next thing is like, who, who do I know that does have that network and, and how might, you know, I work through them to, to get connected. And so there's, you know, there's a, a constant amount of hustling to, uh, to be able to get into those networks. And then at some point, you're either doing what you say that you you, you were going to do, and then it becomes a little bit easier. And so I think once we had a prototype in the water, it became a little bit easier to go back to some of those early investors that said, well, I don't know about you all. Like, can you do it? I'm like, hey, we did it. Are you in? Yeah. Yes or no, let's talk. And we had a couple of folks that are like, yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. You've actually done quite a bit. Uh, amusingly, we've recently had a few folks that are like, shoot, now you're too late. You're asking for too much. And it's like, well, you missed, you missed yeah. your opportunity. You should have you should have written a check, you know, six months ago. We said this is what we we're going to do, and so yeah, you, know, you can't you can't take it personally. I would say that you know, similar to running a company or you know, being a parent or you know, anything where you're sort of both vulnerable and, and also in sort of a leadership position, uh, you kind of have to yeah, to develop a little bit of a tough skin because you are you're going to get way more rejections than yeses until that changes you know and 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 you have to just you know for every no there's an opportunity for a new yes and you have to kind of get after that so you you've done one you you mentioned you've kind of done mentoring for some time you've you know created us you know pitch ideas for some time really give some give the audience a little bit of kind of it's you know knowledge you know drop some drop some knowledge on us like what what goes into a pitch what goes into maybe a, a successful pitch? You know, what are, what are those venture capitalists looking for? So if somebody's listening and they're trying to scale as well, what are, what are some, you know, what's some advice you would give to them? Sure. Uh, I think, I think the first advice that I would impart even before you get to particular VCs, make sure you're talking to the right person. You know, there, there are VCs that write checks at every stage of the game and, if you're talking to someone that you know writes later stage checks and you're looking for your first check you're, you're going to be you know a, a mismatch right out of the gate so first piece of advice is just to do some research uh the second is is that you will eventually get to that stage where that investor that was too later of a stage uh might write you a check and so keeping notes about people that you've reached out to or have come in contact with you know using a, a, a crm like a customer relationship management tool uh, makes a lot of sense and so think through the VC research uh, pitch process the same way you would think about a sales process. And so we use a tool called Pipedrive where we manage the various funnels, uh, the various uh, stages of the funnel, uh, you know, from outreach to inbound interest. And we are very diligent about what are the next action items, who has the ball and, and who's communicating and then kind of standardizing that. Um, because it, it gets to a, an unwieldy scale very quickly. Like you might be talking to several hundred VCs over the course of a year, and it is impossible to remember yeah. every single detail of those conversations and what they are. So first bit of advice is get organized uh, and go from there. And then I think having uh, a consistent and quickly able to send a set of materials is the next part of it. And, you know, truthfully, you will find all sorts of advice for like what the optimal size, duration, length of a pitch deck is. You've got people that prescribe to be no more than 10 pages and there's people who say 12 pages. There's some that are 15 and some say no more than, you know, 18. I, whatever the math is, you know, we, I think ours right now is maybe a, a 17 page, you know, uh, teaser deck um, that it is written to be self-guided. And so that is to say, you're not delivering it. There is you know, more text on there than I as a previously design centric individual would feel comfortable with for any client presentation, but it needs to be self-guided, right? So there's words. Gotcha. Uh, I, you know, and so explaining what the problem is, uh, what your solution is, uh, what your differentiation is, how you make money, your team, the strength of your team and what your strategy to get more customers, right? The, the revenue model, like having that narrative really easily baked in uh, quickly enough to kind of capture someone's attention is really critical for that. You're not you're not sending a 50 page deck out of the gate. 
you're not sending a ton of fluff. It's, it needs to be short and succinct. And if, so if you need, if you can do it in 10 pages, great. If you need 12, go for it. If you need 15, fine. Um, and then I think there's the, there's the version of the deck that you present live that you, you know, when you do have someone in person and they want to, they want you to see it. Uh, that one does have a lot less words uh, on 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 the screen because you don't want them to get bogged down on a Zoom or if you're in a you know physical room on the tiny text. So you need to have your script. And and so one of the things that one of our advisors, who's one of our early investors, uh, worked on was write the script. What's what's the, what's the story that you're going to tell and and write that out and memorize that. And that's really valuable insight because you don't want to be fumbling through your slides and reordering things. Like you need yeah. to you be, need to be able to give your pitch. You know, the eight minute version, the five minute version, the 12 minute version, uh, and even the difference between all of those without even having a slide behind you. And you just have muscle memory of like when you hit click yeah. uh, and you're not even seeing it, right? You're just click. Uh, and you got to practice that. And, and you practice it by locking yourself in a closet, in a room, in a quiet space, and you record it. And then you, you play it back and you're like, oh, that didn't sound right. That, that's, a, that's a hard sequence of words to, yeah. to, to kind of release in, you know, this amount of time. Uh, and you edit and you re-edit and you pitch and you present and, and you keep practicing because, you know, month over month aspects of that story are going to change. You're going to get more insights from customers. You're going to get uh, more insights from investors. You, you keep adjusting it, but you need to have that script. And so I would say that there's probably, you know, three, three assets that you're constantly noodling with. One is the narrative. That's the word doc. That's your story. There's the teaser deck. That's the thing that you send over. That's got a lot of words. A lot of those words are in your story, so that kind of forms the other. And then there's the very beautiful visual, simple, you know, five words on a on a slide kind of a thing that explain the story, the vision, and then yes, have some charts and graphs to kind of explain the, the potential as well uh, that would accompany you for a live pitch. Uh, and then you know, if, if that captures enough attention, then ultimately then you're you know, entering into diligence with VCs where they want they do want to see the spreadsheets, the financials, and the applications and, and all that other stuff and and that you know uh, you can make that as pretty as you want you know organize it is, is my advice we like google drive for that but others might want to use something like notion or carta that have like deal room data room type stuff um key thing is get organized do your research uh and show up prepared uh, to your to your pitches yeah and you know i think that's that's great advice even for those that aren't you know pitching a venture capitalist if you're presenting any anything uh, you know practicing your presentation if you're if your presentation, if you're using keynote or if you're using PowerPoint, whatever it is, if, if an individual can look at your slides and really know the story, just looking at your slides without you having to say anything, then you probably have too much content on your slides, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I keep my slides mostly just photos, a couple bullet points per slide, keep them very simple because the goal is, is really you're, you're the value. Right. Your story, as you're mentioning, you know, Marcelino, the way the way you tell the story, the way you present it, uh, that's what's going to kind of create the engagement. And I'm talking to my, you know, for myself when I do, you know, presentations uh, with the way I kind of engage the audiences, I do a create a story. And then when they ask me for the slides when I'm done, I'm like, sure, but it might not make sense anymore because the story was the, the verbal piece, right? That's, that's to your point, right? You kind of create this beautiful story, but with a little bit of visuals. Now you've been kind of, you're starting to scale, you're starting to build up. What would you say has been pretty difficult about you're kind of starting a new, a, a whole new industry, right? I mean, there are electric boats out there, but you're kind of redefining it. What has been difficult? I think some of the, the difficulties are, Thinking through the supply chain aspects that have certainly plagued, you know, every industry over the last two years and, and recognizing that we're not going to be out of the woods for some of those things anytime soon. And so for us, that means, you know, building relationships with battery suppliers, uh, connecting with manufacturers that can make some of the components that we ultimately hope to manufacture at scale. And even if we're, you know, say 16 months from, you know, manufacturing anything at scale, the conversations for who is helping us out at what point start now. And, and, and so getting into those conversations, really understanding what it looks like to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C for anything. And that's true of, you know, who's the boat that we're going to show up with, you know, in, in Miami uh, to, you know, who's the battery supplier for that boat? Who, who's the backup for that? Who's the backup for, you know, X, Y, or Z component? And just having redundancy, which, you know, ultimately, 
that just takes time and, and it takes time and, and, and practice and trial and, and, and testing out products. So that's kind of been, you know, uh, on the maybe engineering sort of logistics side been, been one of the harder, harder things. Obviously getting sufficiently capitalized, I, I think is, is, you know, another challenge that we're obviously in progress on that and working on it. We're talking to some really good uh, potential investors, but uh, it is a capital intensive business. And, and, and uh, there is always risk that someone comes in with a lot more money and can get farther with an inferior product. And, and I would certainly say that, you know, the, the industry, you know, industries that, you know, are, are, are plagued with examples of, you know, uh, the, the Nest thermostat wasn't necessarily the best thermostat. It was, you know, maybe the best designed one that maybe didn't work as well, but also very well capitalized uh, thermostat. Not to say that Honeywell or anyone else building connected thermostats couldn't have one that they just they just they just missed the window. So, uh, really thinking through where we can, you know, learn from, you know, others in the space uh, to really understand, you know, how to win. And 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 I think fundamentally, whether it's Nest or you know the iPod or you know, the Tesla certainly wasn't the first electric car, uh, but it was the best designed electric car. It had the best software interface. It had the best connectivity. Uh, if you think through, you know, the iPod, the iPhone, the the Nest, uh, the, the Tesla, like these were all examples where a hardware product that was not the first to market became the incumbent by beating everybody else with a combination of hardware and software. And we're going to do that for, for electric outboard motors because everyone else is just looking at the hardware and, and, and they, they want to solve for that. And, and we want to build a connected, a connected boat for our customers. And, and ultimately we think that will win uh, because it's you know, been proven that that, that wins in, in, in other places uh, where, where the incumbents and even the early entrants are challenged by someone who's looking at it very holistically. Uh, and our competitors aren't, they're, they're very narrowly focused, uh, you know, for, for different reasons. Uh, you know, I think some are, are very plausible reasons why they should be narrowly focused, but uh, they're, they're missing out uh, on quite a bit. So trying to get overcome some of those, you know, early scale challenges around capitalization, but also recognizing that even as we do try to overcome those challenges, that we can win by thinking about our solution holistically across, you know, hardware, software, and really understanding a user's needs. You know, I think I think the listeners understand kind of like you mentioned you're doing the show in Miami coming up where you're going to be unveiling the new prototype. And I think the listeners kind of understand a bit, you know, the value of it. But I wanted them to kind of hear it from you. What are what are some of the benefits you see, you know, as being an entrepreneur attending some of these trade shows? What are the benefits you see about doing that? Trade shows are a captured audience, right? It's also an, an opportunity to establish a market presence. You know, in, in particular, the Miami Boat Show for us, it's it's a bit like the CES, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show of the boating industry. And admittedly, you know, some of our customers might not be there, right? Because we're targeting commercial fleets or targeting work boats or targeting mariculture boats. But it is certainly the most covered boating event in, in our industry. And so there's an opportunity there to establish ourselves as a legitimate force. And that is the intent there. Obviously there are networking opportunities, obviously, you know, being in Miami, a number of our cruise customers are, are headquartered out of there. So we're, we're hoping to really leverage quite a bit out of that event. Um, but I'll say that, you know, taking a step back, we, we attended the boat show in Miami in February of this year. And we didn't exhibit, but we were there. And we were there meeting and greeting and understanding the lay of the land. And, you know, I'd certainly been a boat show that I'd attended to many, many times with, with, my, with my dad and my family, you know, as, as a little kid. But this was the first time where I was there with like a notebook, right? And, and really taking notes and understanding, like, how do we enter this and, and how, do we, how do we win? Uh, and we're doing the same with the other boat shows and the other conferences that we intend to exhibit at next year, which is to say we're attending each of those first as, uh, uh, you know, uh, an attendee uh, with a notebook, you know, maybe talking to suppliers or the partners, but not an exhibit. We're doing our research so that we may show up at, at the one that we do exhibit with a, with a better product or better angle or better, you know, uh, approach to, to customer conversations. And you know, at the hybrid work environment that we have found ourselves in over the last, you know, three years has made quite a bit more accessible. At the same time, there's just limitations to what you can do virtually and, and creating serendipity is one of those things. And so being present at that event and finding yourself 
you know, at a happy hour or a networking event with some of your counterparts, competitors, investors, that's the sort of thing that you're not going to recreate on a Zoom. And so you just have to, mm-hmm. you have to show up and, and get there. And then once you're there, you have to be prepared to, to, to exhibit, right? Like it's not just a matter of saying, look, here's a boat, yeah. here's yeah. a motor. Uh, it's being able to figure out what's the narrative, right? What's, what's the, what's the arc of, of a conversation. And so, uh, you know, we recently attended a wooden boat festival up in uh, Port Townsend, oh, Washington. Uh, obviously our, our boat is not made out of wood, <laughs> but it was our debut, it was our debut, debut uh, boat show. And it was just really, you know, useful uh, for us to understand what types of questions were that people had at, at a boat show. Certainly one where they hadn't seen an electric uh, system like this before. They've seen other very vari- you know variations on electric, uh, and, and it was just great. It was, it was good recon for us, good insight for us. And so again, uh, I think doing the research, getting out there, uh, doing the hard work, and creating opportunities for serendipity are things that that are important at trade shows. And then getting getting coverage right. So uh, working with local press uh, to get sort of the write ups that that are going to allow you to then point back to it the rest of the year and, and establish yourself as as a legitimate contender in a new industry. You know what I love about this whole t- entire conversation, particularly talking about the Miami event, this is the first time you mentioned that you're going to be having a booth and you're going to unveil your prototype. Getting in the event is not enough. You've been talking, you're like, no, getting in and win. We're going to win. We're gonna, I'm like, I'm amped up right now. <laughs> you got me amped up talking about it. I'm like, you're, you're like ready to do this. And you got me behind you, man. So, but you're, you're also talking about marketing, right? And you're talking about targeting. Who, who would you say is, you know, Photon Marine's, you know, target audience? Is it, is it the consumer? Or is it the commercial? Because you've been kind of talking about both. Who is the, the target audience? Yeah, target audience is, is commercial. So think uh, mom and pop shop that maybe operates a whale watching operation in, in Juneau, Alaska. Think of uh, a small scuba dive shop uh, in, in Belize. Uh, think about a large cruise company that operates, you know, in the Bahamas uh, or a mariculture operation that operates in Hawaii. These are businesses uh, for whom the last few years have been really difficult. Uh, the, the cost of marine fuel has made it really prohibitively expensive for them to operate their motors. So, you know, gas and, uh, for marine is about a dollar more per gallon than street fuel because it doesn't have ethanol in it. So gas is their second highest expense be, uh, you know, behind personnel. Uh, the supply chain we've talked a little bit about, right, yep. has been impacted. So when a $100 part breaks on their motor, they have to, you know, wait maybe weeks or months to get that part. If they can't repair it, that means that they're off the water. Uh, and, and these are businesses that are generally on the water five, six, seven days a week. And so every day that they're off the water, that's lost revenue, yeah. you know, whether it's tourism revenue, mariculture revenue, or, you know, or even just, you know, water taxi, you know, passenger revenue. And, and uh, to compound things, you know, you've got a, a depressed, you know, workforce, you have fewer people traveling. So they're just, they're making less money, they have less resources to kind of meet those needs. The, the value prop that they see in electric is, is a system that requires less maintenance. So, you know, the gas yeah. motors require maintenance every 300 hours for you and me as a as a recreational boater that might be once every three years the commercial folks are hitting those limits every six weeks and so that means that every six weeks they're doing an oil change every six weeks they have to take their boat out of the water to do that replace the filter replace the spark plug replace the impeller and that's if they do the entire service most of them are kind of skipping that because it's so prohibitively expensive to do that every six weeks and so that means that those motors they're, they're breaking you know much sooner for the commercial side than they are uh, for the recreational, and it's fundamentally because outboard motors were designed for recreational boaters. They aren't really designed for commercial boaters. And 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 so the value prop of electric is here's the motor that's designed for your needs. Here's a motor that's not going to require you taking it out of the water every six weeks, which means you can just keep going. You can just keep going. I mean, you're just continuing to make revenue. You've got less to worry about, less maintenance, less things to break. Um, and and the operators get that, and it, it's it's a reason why. We're excited about this as a market segment because, you know, for them that, you know, if fuel gets really expensive, they can't say, hey, we're not not going to go out. They have to go out, you know. And so for them, they see the value of, of the system, even if it's more expensive, you know, up front than, than, an elect, than a gas one uh, because the payback periods are really quickly. And so for a variety of our customers, you know, they see payback between 18 months and, and maybe 25, 26 months. That is, you know, going to be way different on the recreational side if you're only using your boat or 300 hours a year. So our customers use their boats 1,500 to 1,800 hours a year, day in, day out. They're abusing those systems. They're on the water every day. And so they need something that can withstand uh, that, that intense level of usage. 
And and to, you kind of mentioned this earlier. It's it's environmental friendly. Absolutely, uh, no fumes, no oil changes, less noise. You know, there've been plenty of studies done on the the impact of noise uh, on uh, on you know megafauna, so whales, dolphins, uh, and, and 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 reefs. Uh, there's no oil spills. Uh, you know, in a lot of places in emerging markets, they're still using two-stroke motors that release up to twenty five percent of their fuel unburnt straight into the water. Wow. So just imagine that you wow. fill up a, a hundred gallon tank of gas and you say, you know what, I'm going to take 25 gallons of that. I'm just going to dump it straight into the ocean. That's what a two stroke motor is. Jesus. And they are still used because they're easier to repair uh, or they're easier to find parts for. And so you'll find yourself in an ecotourist report, resort in Belize that's still using two strokes because it's more convenient. And you're like, but you are, your entire business is predicated on this beautiful beach still being here 10 years from now, and you're just dumping 25% of your fuel straight into the water column. Like, yeah, but it's easier. Um, so yeah, the, 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 I, I think the opportunity is for environmentally you know, cleaner motor. I would love to tell you that that's the reason why most of our customers are interested. I, I, it, it's not, it, it, just, it, it adds up economically. It's got a, a, a cheaper total cost of ownership and a lower monthly cost and less maintenance. And that's, that's primarily what drives people. Yeah. I wish it was the other way around, but, but it needs to, it need, you know, we're, we're not running a nonprofit and certainly our yeah. customers aren't either. So it just, it just needs to pencil out. And the fringe benefit is, oh yeah. And it doesn't destroy the environment, which yeah. again, if it were up to me, if it were up to me, I would lead with that. But, yeah. but for others, it's, yeah, it makes sense. Know, they don't, it's not, not priority number one. So, so where's, where is going to be, where, where's the next five years, Legia? Where, where you see yourself in five years? Where do you see Photon Marine in five years? Oh, man, five years is a long way. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to think about, you know, I'm so focused on five yeah, months what, being let's in February. Just, and let's, do the next, let's do the next year. Where do you see yourself in the next year? Next year. I would love by this time next year uh, to have an absolute clear plan of where our first 500 motors are going to. Uh, with an understanding of region, geography, batteries, and sort of what the uh, overlapping benefit is to the customer. Because we've heard different aspects from, from different things. And I think beyond that, it's, it's really about scaling up that operation. You know, we believe that with two, perhaps three different motors, we can reach a majority of the commercial customers that use outboard motors. Uh, we do have some ideas for what an entrant might one day look like into the recreational space. And that might be within that five-year horizon. Uh, we have some cool ideas for some really kind of kind of out there designs for an outboard motor that doesn't look like a traditional outboard motor. And, and we're excited to kind of test those out and prototype. I think for me in five years, I'd love to be able to take my kids uh, to a place where technology has been deployed and, uh, and not have AirPods in my ear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and say, hey, this this is this is this is what I'm doing, and this is why I'm doing it, and let them appreciate uh, those waters and, and those areas. I love it. So, for the folks at home, how can they get involved if they are interested in learning more, maybe in connecting with you? How give them some information? Are you on social media websites? Yeah, I was gonna say I'm on Twitter, but I'm not sure how much longer <laughs> that's gonna be. Um, uh, you and me both. <laughs> Goodness for for another podcast, but um, uh, yeah. So we're uh, we're Photon Marine uh, www.photonmarine.com uh, at Photon Marine on Instagram at Photon Marine on Twitter. Uh, same thing on LinkedIn. I, I think that one perhaps is of, of the social networks the, the one that's not run by a, a, a ego egomaniac at the moment. At the moment. Um, we'll see it's the last <laughs> last one standing. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, if you're in Portland, happy to, to meet up and, and grab a coffee. And if not, happy to grab a virtual coffee and, and chat about all the things. You know, we're looking for uh, collaborators, uh, uh, investors, customers, partners, you know, advisors, you name it. Uh, you know, just interesting people just to kind of exchange thoughts and ideas with. So uh, please reach out. Uh, you'll find us. You'll find us on the Internet somewhere. Marcelino Alvarez, the chief executive officer and co-founder of Photon Marine. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I, I, I'm, I'm not even lying, man. You got me amped up about this Miami show. I'm not even going. I'm like, you guys are going to win. <laughs> That's the way you're talking about it. 
Uh, I'm very excited to see this take off because I, I really do see it being a huge benefit to our environment, which, as you mentioned, I know we don't lead with, but we, we probably should be uh, leading with that. Uh, and uh, good luck to you. I wish you guys nothing but the best. For those folks listening at home, you can follow me at the Shades of E on the social sites. Again, you can subscribe to the newsletter. We'll have Photon Marine information on there for three weeks in a row. So please uh, subscribe so you can get that information. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.